The Residents, a music, art, and performance group from San Francisco. My name is Homer Flynn, Captain Doc, President of the Cryptic Corporation. Cryptic is the band's business and public relations interface. For the unaware, the residents are and have remained anonymous, unnamed and unseen without masks for nearly 50 years. Hence, the need for a stooge like me to sit here and put words in their mute and empty mouths. Okay, how did we get here? Settle in, it's a long story, but first, I want to thank Soho Radio and Cherry Red Records for making this residence special possible. Cherry Red has not only released Metal Meat and Bone, the album we are promoting, but they have also published the Residence Preserve series, an excellent collection of the group's extensive back catalog, with each release containing not only the album as originally produced by the Residence, but also additional discs of unreleased tracks, alternative mixes, and live versions of the band's songs. Okay, on with the story. The residents are from the American South, and like so many from that region, they were influenced by the blues at an early age. One of the group's trademarks has been the exploration of various forms of music, from music concrete to jazz, country and western, industrial and Polynesian pop, but they never examined the blues nearly as extensively as they wanted. As time passed, they searched for a door, an opening into the genre that would allow them to dive as deeply into the blues as their passion for the form demanded. But sadly, no door into the idiosyncratic style appeared until a few years ago, one of the residents was back in Louisiana having lunch with an old friend named Roland Sheehan. Roland still lives in Ruston, Louisiana, where several from the group went to college, and as they chatted, the band's interest in the blues was casually mentioned. As usual, the conversation moved on to other topics, the blues becoming a soon forgotten comment as far as the resident was concerned, but not so for Sheehan. Soon, their former colleague came calling on the group with an idea, something he had long forgotten. It seems that Sheehan had met and encouraged an aspiring blues singer, Alvin Snow, back in the mid-1970s. Working with Snow and his original songs, they recorded 10 demos for Stan Lewis, a record store and label owner in Shreveport. But just before Snow's band was about to perform its first date, the blues man disappeared and was never heard from again. While the residents found their friend, Roland Sheehan's story, to be mildly interesting, it was hard to imagine finding inspiration in 40-year-old demos from a wannabe blues singer that no one had ever heard of, until, until they listened to Snow's music. More conversations with Sheehan revealed details about Alvin Snow's life as a half-white, half-black albino abandoned at birth to his reverence for Howling Wolf, his predilection for meeting and exploiting older white women, and his love for a cripple mongrel whose tragic death gave birth to the blues man's nom de plume dying dog. And the more the residents discovered about Alvin Snow, the more intrigued they became. Suddenly it was bingo, the idea, the vehicle for exploring the blues that the residents had long sought was born. They would not only give Alvin Snow the exposure he long deserved, they would also interpret his music in their own style and, as a bonus, the group created six additional new songs inspired by the long lost musician. But, in addition to introducing Alvin Snow, along with the residents appreciation of his music, we're also explaining how we got here. We being the residents, you, our gracious and tolerant audience, me, Homer Flynn of the Cryptic Corporation, and our generous hosts at Soho Radio and Cherry Red Records. It all starts back in the South in the 1960s. The residents, as well as myself, were teenagers at the time, and several of us went to the same high school in Shreveport, Louisiana. It was in the spring of 1963 
that a group of us were about to graduate. The ultimate event of one's senior year at that time and place was something called the German dance. Now, why was it called that? Did everyone wear lederhosen and Tyrolean hats and dance to a rousing um pa pa beat? Sadly, at this point in time, the origin and raison d'etre of the German dance is lost in the mists of time. But the reality was that as soon as the staid and boring senior prom ended at midnight, everyone put on their jeans and t-shirts and danced their asses off to a baffo rock band from 2 to 6 a.m. And whose band did the seniors at Bird High rock out to in 1963? None other than the one and only Bo Diddley. Yes, the amazing Bo Diddley played for the residents at Bird High School's German dance in 1963. And the impression he made was indelible. Okay, you say, but Bo Diddley was playing rock and roll, not blues. To which I have to respond, hey, dudes and dudettes, sorry, but you are not paying attention. What do you think rock and roll was? Other than a very successful marketing device, it was nothing but jacked up blues that black pioneers like Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, and Little Richard had been playing for years. While Elvis Presley gets credit for having made black music safe for white audiences, Elvis's first hit was Heartbreak Hotel in 1956, while Bo Diddley was topping the R&B charts a year earlier with his first self-titled hit, Bo Diddley. But Mr. D was far from the only blues artist influencing the as yet unnamed and unformed residents in the late 50s and 60s. One of the Faceless Four loves to tell the story of the moment when he was sitting in his bedroom at his parents' house listening to an ancient clock radio when a demonically catchy piano part grabbed his attention. This was the pre-Beatles era of throwaway pop like the Chipmunk Song and Tallahassee Lassie by Freddie Boom Boom Cannon, and the resident was completely mesmerized by a 50-second electric piano intro to a song that was unlike anything he had heard before. It was amazing. It was great. And it was Ray Charles. The song was What'd I Say, and the hit, Charles' first gold record, was part one of his six-minute opus, which was cut in half for radio play. The second song of that pair was the inimitable Ray Charles performing his version of the classic You Are My Sunshine. What the residents learned from this, as well as other Charles interpretations, is that if you're going to cover someone else's music, you have to make it your own. As a slight aside, I feel an obligation to enlighten my audience with a little known fact that You Are My Sunshine was written by Jimmy Davis, a former governor of Louisiana, in honor of his horse, Sunshine. Shortly after Brother Ray made this song a hit, the K.A. fraternity at Louisiana Tech borrowed Sunshine so that the fraternity's pledges, in Civil War uniforms no less, could, with great chivalry, deliver invitations to their dates for the frat's annual Old South Ball on horseback. After the invitations were successfully handed out, a pair of pledges were performing the task of returning sunshine to the former governor when their trailer came unhitched and ran off the road, killing the hapless horse. Consequently, from that day forward, any time several fraternities came together at a social gathering, the K.A.'s were gleefully serenaded by heartfelt renditions of You Are My Sunshine. Again, this is a residence radio special focused on the group's latest release, Metal, Meat, and Bone, and brought to you by Cherry Red Records. I'm Homer Flynn, manager and mouthpiece for the anonymous group from San Francisco. But before we dive too much deeper into the residents' blues influences, it's only fair to say that R&B and blues acts were only a few of the artists impacting the group in their formative years. From Sun Ra, Moondog, and Captain Beefheart, to Stan Kenton, Giorgio Moroder, and Henry Mancini, 
the residents were listening to and influenced by a wide array of musical styles, resulting in a series of albums that showcase both pop and avant-garde elements with equal ease. But this program is about the residents, and I mentioned R&B and blues a few moments ago as more or less interchangeable terms, but there are those who would take offense at the lumping together of two similar, but not necessarily matching forms. But personally, I see culture as a monster in motion, constantly evolving and morphing towards the demands of capitalistic consumerism. The idea of purity is an illusion, fed by obscurity and the simple fact that the pure are either blind to or deprived of the opportunities of corruption, while reality, in a culture where money is king, is product. Without it, as an artist, you don't exist. Okay, enough dubious philosophy. Many consider Bobby Blue Bland to be the ultimate R&B singer a statement to which I offer no argument. The residents were also fortunate to experience Bobby in his prime in the early 1960s at a drunken blowout at the notorious 40 and 8 club near Cross Lake in Shreveport. One of them loves to tell the story of how the intro to Bobby's seminal hit 362236 roused him from a drunken stupor propelling the youth to the edge of the stage where he could worship every nuance, vibration, and aching tone emanating from the great man's lips. Those were the days. But this portion of the radio special, which is really about the residents' influences when their taste and artistic values were still forming, can't be complete without the artist whose impact on the group was both unique and unequal, James Brown. The best James Brown story I can repeat from residents lore goes back to 1965. Several of them had just seen the amazing Mr. Brown in concert at the University of Southwestern Louisiana in Lafayette. After the mind-altering show featuring Brown at his absolute peak, the group was cruising around when they spotted James Buss, his equipment truck, and a Cadillac reserved for the entertainer, his wife, and manager, all parked at a gas station. Unable to withhold their adulation, the group quickly connected with Brown's entourage, only to discover that the troop was lost, unable to find the entrance to the newly built Interstate 10 freeway traversing South Louisiana. Since one of the group attended USL, he was aware of the largely unmarked freeway entrances and volunteered to guide Brown's company to the freeway. After a seemingly endless journey through back streets and country roads, the entertainer's group, fearful of being led astray, stopped, and James got out of the Cadillac, demanding to know what was happening. After a brief explanation, pointing out the freeway entrance a few hundred yards ahead, James broke into a big smile, thanked and shook hands with all and disappeared into the night, leaving a stunned coterie of future residents shaking their heads in amazement. Flash forward 35 years and the residents were sound checking at the Hard Rock Cafe in Las Vegas when who should appear but James Brown, checking out the venue for a possible appearance. After a perfunctory meet and greet, one of the band's members told James that they had met before, repeating the story of the curious quest for the lost freeway in South Louisiana. Listening with a blank look on his face, James politely shook his head and said, sorry, but he couldn't remember. For the residents, that night long ago was forever etched in memory as a magic moment beyond compare, but for James Brown, it was just another night on the road. Oh yeah, for those interested in catching the Godfather of Soul at his high energy and hypnotic best, check out James Brown and the Famous Flames, The Legendary Tammy Show on YouTube. It's 17 minutes of magic that will blow your mind. Okay, okay, all right, I know, more music. 
While for many people, James Brown's ultimate iconic album is his opus, Live at the Apollo, I recently discovered a great track from Brown's lesser known follow-up, Live at the Apollo 2. For those just joining us, I am Homer Flynn, manager of The Residence, hosting a special on the group's long-standing appreciation and reverence of the blues. Special thanks to Soho Radio and Cherry Red Records for making this possible. Okay, following James Brown's There Was a Time from his Live at the Apollo 2 album was none other than the residents performing their version of the James Brown classic It's a Man's 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 World, originally recorded by the group in 1984. Okay, that wraps up the pre-residence portion of the special. Not long after their early James Brown experience, the group moved to California. They formalized their association as the residents and launched into their ongoing career. But their interest in the blues and R&B was not left behind in Louisiana. Somehow, while still in the South, they managed to miss one of the all-time greats, a performer some would label as the greatest blues singer of all time, Howling Wolf. It was not until the 1970s, sadly a few years after his passing, that the group discovered the wolf. Again, for them, this was a performer who would change the equation. The power and purity of Howling Wolf's voice seduced them like a horde of hungry bears sucked into a magic mountain of honey. And that brings us back to Alvin Snow also known as Dying Dog. A secretive man, little is known of Alvin's life, but this much is certain. His introduction and subsequent devotion to Howling Wolf completely changed the albino's life. Snow's existence, up to the time he first encountered the wolf blasting out of a jukebox in a small Mississippi town, had amounted to little more than a series of predatory episodes most ending a few steps ahead of the law as he hustled his way from one small southern town to another. An ultimate outsider, Snow connected with and cared about no one until the pure emotion of Howling Wolf's voice opened a door into his own humanity, a door invisible to Snow, until that moment of spiritual awakening when Dying Dog was born. And in that moment, the dog erupted with a sense of direction and passion previously unknown in Alvin Snow's limited self-involved world, creating a rage for the truth and a purity of expression that burned like a barrel full of rocket fuel in the small man's soul, right up to the moment he learned of Howling Wolf's death. The wolf had been his god, and with no deity from which to draw inspiration, dying dog ceased to exist and Alvin Snow was lost again. We're thrilled to have this chance to document the residents long-standing attachment to the blues and how it came to be revealed in their discovery and exploration of Alvin Snow aka dying dog. Meanwhile, hey Alvin, if you're out there listening, take care and boogie down dude. A million mercies to Soho Radio and Cherry Red Records, and thanks for listening.